can go towards this. That's two, and for 18, then we'll go to Proverbs. And just two, and verse 18, I think we have on the screen, if you want to look it up there, you can as well. Okay. Uh, let me read it to you first, then we'll recite it. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. This chapter, James chapter 2, um, has been difficult for some. I think even when we read through it, uh, it's hard for us because we've always been taught or for a long time been taught that salvation is by faith and not by works. So if you just read this chapter, you might be a little confused about that. Um, they say that Martin Luther actually, I don't know if this is true, but tore out the book of James because he could not, he couldn't reconcile how this would fit with the rest of the passages on faith alone. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't think we need to tear it out, but we do need to have an understanding of what this is saying. Uh, in verse 18, he's, he's not saying you're saved by your works, but he's saying if you are saved, then your works will reveal your faith. It will prove your faith. Um, that's that's not the you know the source, but it is it is the proof. And if you don't have any works, if there's no fruit, then is the faith really there? So I think we just have to have that understanding. But really good verse. Thank you for choosing that. Let's let's say reference verse reference as you do. Ready? James two eighteen. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have worked. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Okay, back to Proverbs now. Proverbs chapter 7. We have studied this chapter before. Uh, we studied on Wednesday nights. So we're going through the book of Proverbs. We have studied this chapter in this study and the men's study. But sometimes God just brings you back to a passage, and there's always something new and fresh whenever you read a uh, familiar passage like this one is. Uh, this is a sobering chapter, it's a chapter of warning to us, and I think we as men, uh, we need to look at these things often. So we're going to read the chapter, uh, it takes a little bit of time, we're going to identify four different characters within the chapter and focus in on one character. Uh, the one character that really not much is said about, but I, I think we need, to, uh, we need to take a closer look. So... Uh, let's read. Uh, I don't know who, who online would like to read. I don't know if, if you're not able to read, you're not in a place where you can read. Uh, anybody online would like to read? Yeah, I can, I read. can read. Okay. Uh, I, can, I cannot today. Okay, so we'll get Nick and Guy, and we'll let Scott off. Okay, sounds good. Pray for Scott, to um, Scott is teaching uh, men, I'm sorry, not men's study, this is men's study, adult Sunday school tomorrow, so pray for him, he's got a great lesson, God's going to start, so pray for you, Scott. Okay, um, I will, you're welcome, I'll start with verse one, Larry, Ron, Brian, Christian, George, Steve, Rick, Isaiah, uh, Nick, Guy, and then back to me until we finish the chapter. Chapter seven, verse one. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live in my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the table of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman. That they may keep thee from the strange woman and from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Put it in the window of my house and look to my kinswoman. I saw among the simple, and there was still one of the young men, a youth with black judgment. Passing through the street near her corner, and he went away to her house. The twilight came in the black dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn, her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him, and kissed him, and with an imprudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me, this day have I paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of 
tapestry with carved works with fine linen of Egypt. And perfume of bed with myrrh, rose and sea. Come, let's drink deep of love to morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. For the good man is not at home, he is gone on a long journey. <clears throat> He has taken the bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway, as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the word from my mouth. Let not thine heart, let not thine heart decline to her ways, go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. For her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Last time we looked at this, we focused on verse 26. Many strong men have been slain. That was the title of the lesson from last year, maybe, maybe the year before uh, when we looked at that. So this is, uh, again, the Ted sobering text in front of us. Uh, wouldn't be a bad thing for us to read this chapter every day of our lives uh, to understand what we're up against and the outcome of choices that we make in uh, these specific areas. Now, let's identify from chapter 7, there are maybe more than four characters, but four main characters in this passage. Can we identify them quickly here? The harlot. Good man. Okay, I heard the good man. That's the one that we're going to talk about. I heard the harlot. That's the one that we seem to focus on the most. Um, who else in the passage? We have the good man. Yeah, yeah void of understanding. Okay, you got the man, yeah, you got the young man too, right? The young man that's void of understanding. And then there's another one not as easily seen. A pig. What was it? A pig. <laughs> A pig. A pig. Okay. Yes, that, that one's not as easily seen, but I'm sure there. <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah, the husband, I think we could also say, is probably the good the good man of verse uh, 19. Yeah, you got the husband. That he's the one we're going to focus on. The other one is, is Solomon or the observer, whatever you want to call him. The one that's looking out his window in verse 6. Uh, so he's he's seeing this play out. And we, we don't always recognize that people are, are observing our actions. If people are not observing our actions, you know, God is always... Seeing God is always looking out the casement of heaven. Everything we do, God sees. There's nothing hidden from the eyes of the Lord. So there's there seems to be four main characters. Again, a lot of attention is given to the young man here and the mistakes that, that he makes, the choices, um, the outcome. A lot of attention is given to the strange woman, the harlot, um, the one that seduces the young man. And there's many, many lessons that we can learn. Uh, as we study those characters. But I want us to go to the good man here uh, in verse 19 and verse 20. Just two verses are given uh, concerning this man, related to this man. Uh, but I want us to look at him. Um, notice it says in verse 19, for the good man is not at home. So here, here is the, the unfaithful wife. She's trying to convince this young man that uh, this sin they're about to participate in will not be found out. The good man is, he's not home. He's gone a long journey. He had taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. To try to remove any fears um, that he may have that they would be found out. So she uses this to convince him. Uh, on our end, as we study uh, this morning, we're gonna learn some things about uh, this good man. Now, what does that term mean? It's the only time you find it in the Old Testament. You do find it several times in the New Testament, in the Gospel records. The good man. There's no there's no break there. There's there's no um, space between good and man. It's one term. Good man. Does anybody have a chance to look that up or know what that means? Let's go with 
Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think a simple definition would just be the husband. Anybody else have something on that? Okay, provider is the provider in the home. Yeah, I'd seen a householder or the master of the house. Yeah, if you would go to the New Testament, I know it's going to be a different word behind the word there. Um, let me just read a couple of the New Testament verses. Matthew 20, 11. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house. Matthew 24, 43. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known and what watched the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Mark 14, 14. And wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the good man of the house, the master saith, where's the guest chamber where I shall eat the pastor of my disciples. Luke 12, 39. And this know that the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come. He would have watched him out and suffered his house to be broken through. And then uh, again in Luke 22, 11. And he shall say unto the good man of the house, the master saith unto thee, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the pastor of my disciples? So you find that term often, or more often in the New Testament, head of the house, master of the house, the householder, the head of the family, is really what that term means there. And we know that God has placed the man in charge of the home. Doesn't mean that the man is more important than the woman, doesn't mean the man is to dominate his family, but it does mean that the man is accountable to God for what happens in his home. When Adam and Eve sinned, it was Adam that was first called before God to give an account for their actions. Eve would also give an account, but that was after Adam. So the ladies have a responsibility as well. This woman was accountable to God for the decisions and the sin that she participated in. But I want us to notice that it's the good man that is most responsible for his house. He, he's in charge of his house. God has given him that responsibility. Let me also point out that when you see the term good man in uh, verse 19, this is talking more about his position than his person. Um, this is more the authority than the character. This, this man, in my opinion, doesn't have the greatest character. So the question is, was this good man really a good man? We don't know a lot about him, but we see some clues in verse 19 and 20 that seem to indicate otherwise. From that, I want us to look at two marks. So we're really at, we're looking at the inverse here of, of what we see in verse 19 and 20, and we're going to develop some marks of a good man. Uh, this was a card from my daughter, her father say, and it was just kind of interesting. It says, from your daughter, if someone asks me what a good man looks like, how he acts and treats others, how he puts his time into what really matters, I would just point to you and say, there's a good man, that's my dad, happy Father's Day, and a uh, note from her. It was a nice card, and that's a tall order to live up to, to be a good man. We also understand from Scripture that there's none righteous, no, not one, that none of us are good. We, we know our hearts. We, we, are, we are wicked to the core, and all of us are capable of doing what happens in this passage and beyond. I mean, we know that. So there's no good men out there, but it's through the goodness of Christ that we can uh, become a, a good husband, good father. So let's, let's look at this passage, and this man here that we see, I believe... His decisions, priorities, his actions had an impact on not just himself, but his family. When you look at this strange woman and you look at her activity, um, you look at the way she carries herself, you look at the lifestyle she's involved in, you think, how does, how does a wife, how do you ever come to that point to, to, be, lit, to, to be at that level? I do believe there's a connection here. I believe that God has made women to be responders. So if you if you find a godly Christian man that has the right priorities, that's loving his wife and loving his family, I don't think you'll see this type of activity. I'm not saying that you'll never find a good man married to a bad woman. But often in Scripture, uh, when you find 
a bad woman, she's got a bad man. There's some, there's something there that's transferred to her. And this woman is not, she's not finding what she needs from her <laughs> husband, so she's turning elsewhere. So let's look at these marks of a good man. Okay, um, verse 19. She says to the young man, void of understanding, the good man, the husband, the householder, the head of the house, is not at home. He's gone a long journey. So let's flip this around. And what is what is a mark of a good man? He should be, I'm going to guess the blank. Present. Present. Good job. He should be present in his home. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to be home 24-7 with, with uh, changes from COVID. A lot of you know, different men can work from home now and be around their family a little bit more. We are called to be providers. We're all used that word provider. So we work, we labor, we provide for our family. But there's a balance here. And, and this man, he's not just gone on a journey. This is a long journey. He's away from home for a long season. And it seems like that the, the pattern. It's almost like he's looking for excuses to get away from his family, from his wife, from his kids. And uh, as a result, the family suffers. So we have to look at the importance of being present. Uh, delinquent dads are responsible for much of the issues in marriages and much of the rebellion in the hearts of kids, just being present. Let's go back to Adam the first man. So the devil is subtle. That's the first adjective used of Satan in scripture. He, he's subtle, the serpent. And he knows that he can attack the woman. She's the weaker vessel. And he purposely attacks her when Adam is not present. So where was Adam when the temptation came? I don't, I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us, but we know he wasn't there. Should he have been there? Probably. And would things have turned out differently? I would assume because he would have been there to help protect his wife. So just being present adds a level of protection in the home. This man's gone. He's on the long journey. We have work trips. Uh, we have responsibilities. Sometimes we have to be separated. All of you have been involved in those things. You, there's times that you just have to go. But when you're gone, you can still be present in a sense. With technology, phone calls and texting and you know, keeping tabs, that's important for us to do that. I haven't had to take a lot of trips away from my wife, um, a few trips here and there, but I try to make it a habit of checking in as much as possible uh, just to see how you're doing, how the kid's doing. So be careful of this. When we're divided, we're more susceptible. And, and here's the good man. He's gone. He's gone on a long journey. He's in a far distant place. And... As a result, his home is going to fall apart. So I think the good man has to be present in his home. Be present as much as you can. One illustration, then we'll move on. David in 1 Samuel 29 and 30. David was at a low point in his life. He joined up with the enemy. He's living in a place called Ziklag. And he and his men are they are going out on these uh, escapades where they're they're attacking and fighting, and they come back, and they find the Amalekites have attacked Ziklag, burned the city with fire, and they have taken all of the women and kids uh, as hostages. And you learn again that okay, there's a place for battle and war, but there's also a place for us to be present to protect our families. And uh, I want to encourage you, you men, to be present in the home. I think this would have turned out differently had this man been around a little bit more. Any thoughts on that point? How do we balance life, work, responsibilities with being there for our spouse and our kids? How do you how do you balance that? We have so much pulling at us. Um, so many things are out of our control with with work. Um, you know, how do you do? How do you be there but also be the provider that you need to be? Any any thoughts on that? Everybody's different. My, my situation is different than your situation. I have not 100%, but I have almost 100% flexibility with my job. I love that. It would be hard for me to go back to a rigid schedule. There's also other things that come with that. I'm on call most of the time, you know, but that's okay. There's, so there's a give and take with any uh, work scenario. But how do you balance 
being present in the home, but also the responsibilities of being a provider. Any thoughts before we move on to the second point? Brian? Well, I think there are seasons of that mm -hmm. where there's going to be a more intense need for you to be present. Uh, and you've got to kind of be sensitive to that. Yeah. Kids get into college, you're more of an advisor. Mm -hmm. And I've learned that people typically don't want your advice until they come to you looking for your advice. Mm -hmm. Don't stir the soup unless somebody says it needs stirred. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that that's one thing to keep in mind. You don't that's have good. to. You don't always have to be. At some yeah. point, they got to get the wind under their wings, yeah. and make their own decisions, go there. Not their own way, but figure some things out on their own. Hopefully, you build the trust where they can come back to you. And I'm in that phase right now, right. where they come back to you and say, "Dad, I had this happen." And um, that's a rich moment when they when they want to come back to you and, and tell you what happened and ask for your advice. So it, yeah. it shows that you, you can advocate for them in in a, in a right way. And so what you're saying, Brian, I think is that when it comes to not so much the marriage, but when it comes to the parenting, there's seasons where you're, you know, let's go to Dan and Sarah. I mean, there, I mean, that baby is so needy, so yeah. vulnerable yeah. right now. But and you go through seasons where, okay, maybe I can travel a little more. Maybe I can work at this, but, but right now, this is, this right. is number one. I, I've got to be here. Yeah. And the, the same, the same style in different seasons, even with your wife yeah. is going to, it's going to shift. You, you know, she's focused on the children. She, you know, she's doing that, she's housekeeping, you know, all the things, maybe working. She's got all that going on. And then the children mature and now they're gone or almost gone. And now there's a different need, though, right? Yeah. So it, it's almost like it, it has to shift over time. The only thing constant is change. Mm -hmm. So we have to be sensitive, I think, to that. You know, it's uh, Scott Pauley, the seasons of life, mm -hmm. and they're not all the same. They're not yeah. all the same. So I think we need yeah. to be sensitive to that. I think we all have a natural sweet spot as well in those relationships. For some guys, it might be the chase in the in the courtship time and not the not not the the, the marriage season necessarily so much. So but if that's exciting for your wife, you need to keep up the chase, right? Um yeah. Yeah. For, the, for the children, I think there's a wheelhouse age for all of us where you know I wasn't necessarily the, the little kid wasn't necessarily my wheelhouse. Um, I think I'm more in the, this is a, mm -hmm. a nice phase for me, but uh, you, know, you got to be able to, to see that and sense that, I yeah. think is important. Yeah. Somebody else have a thought on that, balancing that? <clears throat> that yeah. is pretty interesting with the, the definition of presence. Mm -hmm. this, um, the state or the fact of existing, occurring, or being present in a place or thing. And then a person or thing that exists or is present in a place but is not seen. Mm. So presence to me doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's exclusively mm -hmm. you have to be physically mm -hmm. present. Right. So right. our kids go off to college, you know, it's really important to have them feel our presence mm -hmm. with them. Um, and you have to be you know, much more intentional because, the, as I've shared, some of the threats are pretty scary yeah. when they're in college. Um, but that, yeah, it, it's not necessarily, I'm like you, I have complete flexibility with my time. So mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time with the kids just in general, but um, I don't have to be in the same room mm -hmm. with them um, to have them feel my presence. Yeah, yeah, that's a good thought. Somebody else have a comment? I think uh, just communication, ongoing communication, mm -hmm. um, you know, being present, staying, staying engaged, staying involved, mm -hmm. knowing what's going on. Um, I think our goal as, as fathers or husbands, um, it's not meant to be easy. You know, it's it's not easy to do all those things mm -hmm. when we're, you know, working and there are other things, ministry, things like that. But that is our job. And so whether we like it or not, this is our home. We need to be engaged. We need to just know what's going on. And once when we have that communication, we have um, all this openness, I, I think that it allows very little room for things to just, you know, um, slip through the rug or whatever. You know, like that. Not much because you're still involved in the uh, yeah. yeah. So communication to me is actually a yeah. yeah. 
anybody else yeah. my children yeah, yeah. were young. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Larry. Go ahead. I'll go after you. When my children were young, uh, you know, I had to go to work and they had uh, sports or Carmelo was in the band and all, but before I left from work, I always left them a note you know, to, uh, to know I was uh, thinking about them and mm -hmm. different things I would write. And if my son was in a I'd even draw a little, little pictures. I'm not a good drawer, but I drew little things, maybe like a little stick man, another one on top that was him. And, yeah, yeah. When he was dressed, and then, and that, uh, that carries too, like he's an adult now, he's what, mid 40s, and that's carried over to his children. Uh, so I gave, I made a book of all that stuff, you know, and gave it to him, and uh, his sons really like to read that, and uh, so he does that kind of stuff for his children. Um, but I think once all your children leave home, uh, it's just you and your wife, things really change there too. Because uh, you still pay attention to your children, what they do when they get older, they have their own lives, they do their own things, but you're more just you and your wife. Mm -hmm. and so you have to go back to just two of them, not four or five or six of them. Right. Yeah. Anybody else have a thought on that? Nick's coming. Oh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, if you ask me, I, I don't really have a great answer for this, but I know that there are numerous pressures from society as guys, as fathers, to leave the house. There's numerous things, right? Sporting events, hanging out with the guys, going to you know d different places where they can socialize. There's a big draw from society to get you know fathers out of the house and busy doing other things. I know numerous fathers who feel like, on the other hand, the more time they spend outside the house, the more they're providing for their family. And just like this good man, he's gone on a far away trip and he probably feels like I'm going the distance. I'm doing the hard thing because that's what I need to do for my family. But on the flip side, that takes you far away and perhaps for a long time. So, you know, there, there's a lot there to consider what that balance is. And like I said, I don't have a great answer, but I know that a lot of fathers feel like they're doing the right thing because they're doing something hard that maybe even takes them away all day and all night from their family. Yeah, and I think what's sad is that we feel like we're providing, but what kids and what our spouse needs is not money, they need us. Mm -hmm more than that. So that I, I agree with what you said, Nick. I was gonna add a little bit to that also. Yeah, I was okay. thinking, you know, uh, we need to find interest in what our spouses are interested mm -hmm. in. Yes. As we look at this passage, we really are. it sounds to me like this woman in a way was searching for something yeah. that perhaps, you know, her husband was not providing. Right? If he'd done that, right? Then yeah, maybe this would never happen. So I think for us find interest. Sometimes it may just not be because they yeah. just are different. So sometimes it's interesting to listen and you know, find that interest in what they're, you know, they're sharing. I think you find a woman that is feeling neglected. She's desperate. She wants attention. She doesn't know what love is. Um, she talks about love in verse 18. Mm -hmm. Let us fill ourselves with love. The world thinks lust is love and she's very confused about that and a lot of a lot of people are confused about that but she's seeking love but she can't find it and she's certainly not finding that from her husband so she's going to turn wherever she can to try to meet that void it's sad so yeah I, that's good when, when i was young we, we had a little baby and but i was working two jobs uh Turned out we did all right when I quit the job. But my little baby, he would cry all the time. Yeah. And I was going. Yeah. So then, you know, then I realized that uh, money wasn't everything. Mm -hmm. God provided for us even without that second job. Mm -hmm. And really, that second job, I was just spending the money for different things I really didn't have to. Mm -hmm. So I was just taking away from my land. Yeah.
Let me go from what Larry just said into the second point, leads right into it. So good man should be present in his home. And then a good man should have the right blank in his heart. Because you alliterate, I'm going to go priorities. You're on it today. <laughs> yes, priorities. So yeah. the cheat sheet. <laughs> <laughs> priorities. So look at the next verse where it says he takes a bag of money with him um, and he will come home at the day appointed. So he is. Seem to be more concerned about his money than his marriage. Um, the word there, money, refers to a bag of silver. So he's more concerned about silver than his spouse, finances, and family. See the alliteration, Brian? His wallet than his woman. Yeah, Should I go on? It's just dripping. It's just yeah, you got to go. Um, on the flow. Okay, I'm out. <laughs> uh, but he cares a lot about money. He's got his bag of money. And it says you'll come home at the day appointed. Now, I think that that could be a positive. She knows when he's coming home. He will come home at the day appointed. You look at those words there, it's at the, the new moon. That's kind of the idea. So he had told her when it's new moon, you, I'll be home. It's going to be a long time, and I'll be home. And she believes that he'll come home when he says. He seems to be a man of his word. So that's a positive trait. But he's also very rigid and inflexible with his schedule where he has in his mind this is my routine this is my schedule doesn't matter if my wife or my family needs me i've got this business trip or this journey i'll be home when i say i'll be home and i think that we learn from that that as good men we need to be sensitive men sometimes you have to put things on hold now let, let me tell myself i didn't make well I don't remember all the details of this. I, I could have handled this better than I did. But uh, there was one day, she was trying to get a hold of me. It's been a few years ago, more than a few years ago, like four, I mean, guess, four years ago. And I don't know if I was away from my phone or I just, for some reason, I didn't get the call. She tried to call me like two or three times. And Jackson had hooked up with a neighbor boy. It was like, been raining like crazy. There, our little creek in the back was overflowing. And he had hooked up with the neighbor boy, and they just decided they're going to follow the creek wherever it goes. And he's pretty young at the point, so she, she just lost track of him. She's like, one of our kids is, is missing. And I'm not answering my phone, so she tries to find him, eventually finds him. Uh, in the process, she slips and falls in the mud, loses her phone. Uh, it was just like a bad, just a bad situation. In the meantime, I'm just here studying away, doing my thing. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and I kind of mental note, not that I purposely tried to avoid the situation, but in that situation, I should have been close to the phone, answer the call. Okay. I'll be there as soon as I possibly can. So there's times when we have to realize that home is the highest priority, that whatever I'm doing, I have my schedule, this needs to be done, but there's something of a greater priority is just entered. And, I, and I've got to take this. I was talking with Sheila this past week. We had a lot of time to talk and have some very good, meaningful conversation about the kids. And I asked her about this because I was preparing this earlier this week. I said, what do you think are the marks of a good man? And she said, one, spiritual. The second uh, word was kindness. And the third was sensitive. And I don't know that every woman would agree on those, but I think... The kind and sensitive man that that doesn't mean we're soft. Um, you know, it, it doesn't mean that we don't have backbone, but a woman that knows when I need my husband, he's going to be there for me. He's willing to put his schedule aside because his family is more important. But this man said, look, I'll be home at the appointed time, not, not a moment before. And I think his priorities are misplaced. He's more about his schedule, his things, than his family. I have an observation that kind of ties in. Okay. Like, whenever I read this, um, this sense of a real strong resentment from the woman, mm -hmm. yep. when my husband is not at home, he has gone on a long journey. He took his purse. Yeah. 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 Full of money. Yeah. 
And it's almost like she's acting out in some way. This is mm -hmm. kind of resentment. Yeah. He's, you know, he's, he doesn't care about me. He's just taking yeah. his money. Yeah. Their money. Yeah. Their money. I don't know. No, I, I think that it, it, it's hard to hear the tone of this. But I think you you read that and you pick up on it. Some commentators had suggested that the word "good man" there it it, it actually just means just the man. Like the man is gone. She doesn't use any endearing terms. Yeah. You know, just the man's gone. He has his money. There doesn't seem to be much love and affection um, in the way that she's stating that in her verses. So when a household, uh, if you talk about your income for your money, yeah. it's just it's yes. yes. Even though the, the wife might not be working, right. it's not your money. Yeah. You know? Yeah. The terminology is just very familiar. Yeah. Yep. Not sensitive. Opposite of what we Yeah, I agree, Christian. Well, I mean, I'm not married or uh, in a relationship, uh, so that's not really kind of my angle. But to me, when I look at this, and I look at this woman and how, you know, Purposefully, you know, basically that she's prepared herself uh, mm -hmm. to really be in this relationship with this uh, man who's void of understanding. Uh, you know, to me, I mean, it seems like that it's the it's the byproduct of of the good man, you know, whoever mm -hmm. he is, the husband or not the husband, uh, you know, but because of you know what he's doing, him not being home, you know, so basically abandoning and you know and being gone for a extended period of time. Uh, you know, that this is not the first time and it's probably not going to be the last time, you know, I mean, it's not he comes in, uh, you know, in a short period of time just to check in on his wife or girlfriend, whoever that is. You know, and going back to I mean, what was said before with the bag of money, you know, that he's taking his own personal money, going out, you know, you know I mean, he has something to do. Uh, his wife has nothing else to do, so she's obviously getting involved with other people, but that... Because of those actions of of the man again, whoever he is, uh, you know that that's you know that you're essentially creating that type of woman. Um, so so yeah, I mean, there's a huge responsibility with the way that we act and how we handle the household. You know, you know, and I'll get there at some point in time. Yeah, yeah. But, yep. got so yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My dad, uh, he worked at a factory for a lot of years. He was a machinist and a welder, and occasionally he gets sent on business trips. That they would meet, you know, welders at different uh, <clears throat> jobs. And I remember at least one, two occasions he took us with him. We thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, we stayed in the hotel, and we didn't get to see him a ton because um, he was busy. But just you know, we were close. We were in the same city with him. Went to Boston one time, and you know, it was like. Then that was, I'm sure that wasn't the easiest thing for him. You know, probably always been easier to still leave us at home, but he wanted us as close as we could be. So I think about this man, he's taking his money, but why didn't he just take his wife? You know, I mean, maybe there was some reason he couldn't, but she could have gone with him. And, you know, but again, it goes back to misplaced priorities. Any other comments on uh, this good man? I think what you mentioned earlier about the communication, <clears throat> and my Christian said it is when you read through this, it's obvious this, that this was a pattern for this guy's life. That she had everything prepared, she had everything laid out, mm -hmm. she had everything ready, she had yeah. she, cause she knew yeah. what, the, what the circumstances were going to be. So, that. so I think us being away from home for a period of time, for whatever reason, from time to time, is not hazardous, so mm -hmm. to speak. <clears throat> but it becomes a pattern mm -hmm. where it's all mm -hmm. the time yeah. and freak out done. And then with the lack of communication, you're not yeah. reaching back on you, yeah. you're keeping in touch with your loved ones, like right. the other, the loved ones, this and this year there. I think that's but setting priorities like that. And asking the Lord daily for that, not mm -hmm. only through like with your kids as well. Yeah. Just to you know, show me today what I need to do. You got some facing you that day, yeah. how I handle yeah. that. And it's the best way to do that concerning them. Following the spirit, I think that's the conclusion that that I came to. Is I, I don't know how you know George is saying there's a lot pulling on us. I don't know how to balance everything and you know give myself to my work, but also you know give myself my family. You wish you could clone yourself, divide yourself, and be in two places at once, but you can't. So it's okay. The Lord knows this. Uh, someone said before, God given responsibilities will never conflict. So if God has given you, now if it's not God given, there may be conflict, 
but if God has given you responsibilities as a husband, as a father, as a worker, as a minister, then there's a way they can all complete each other and not, uh, there's no conflict, but we need the Holy Spirit's leading on a day by day, sometimes moment by moment basis. Okay, I'm in this, but I'm sensing that there's a greater need here. So I'm going to have to put this aside, even though I'm in this. And the problem with us is men, once we're in something, we're in something. You know, once we're on it, like it's, we're going to finish this. And it's hard to stop what we're doing and say, hold on, there's a greater need here. I'm going to get back to this. And just, just honestly, letting the Holy Spirit guide us and not our schedule. I've been so convicted that I was sharing with George yesterday about this that, you know, I am so convicted. I got my list and I, and I, I need a list to keep me on track. It's like, I got everything on my list, but was, was this on God's list? And the worst thing I can do is complete my list and not complete God's list. So it's just every day, Lord, what, what do you want me to do today? Help me not to forget the things that need to be done and help me to prioritize on what's most important. Hopefully God will allow us to enjoy a, a good home life. If I could just add one last thing. I, I wouldn't add a third point, but when you talk about kindness and, yeah. and um, what was the sensitivity, sensitivity? Yeah. perspective, yeah. like so often it's me mm -hmm. and maybe the we, yeah. Yeah. but I never see it from yeah. them. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. if I put myself in their shoes for a minute, yeah. like the husband across the street, how does he feel while the mother-in-law is there? And he's got to take care of the kid with the mother-in-law and, and, and the wife is up and down. And how does he feel? Mm -hmm. If I put myself in his shoes for a minute, then I can show him some kindness because I'm like, ooh, yeah. that guy, he's going through the woods too, right? So checking on him as well. And, yeah. and just even even your spouse, especially your children, mm -hmm. how are they feeling? What is their change like right now? Yeah. You know, what is it like for them in this mix of stuff? What might they be going through? What might they be thinking? Then it opens up a whole world as opposed to I have a check mark next to talk to Ben. Yeah. Yeah. No. How's he feeling first? If we get into it, and then it, when he comes to me, I can uh, appreciate it a little bit more. Perspective. Yeah, I agree. And this, and thank you. It's a P that goes along. Uh, I appreciate just, that. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to this passage, here's a here's a wife that's been home all mm -hmm. day, and she probably loved to travel a little bit with him. And you got to think about that. We, you know, we're busy. We're going, doing, but she's just there, and. I think understanding that from a perspective of someone else. So yeah, yeah, maybe I'd like to just go home and just crash, but maybe my wife has been there all day and me to go out. Yeah. She's yeah, out of the house and you know, you know, I'm tired, let's go do yeah. something. Yeah. So just yeah, that perspective is really important. All right. Well, uh, good thoughts. Thank you for the input <clears throat> there. Let's pray and ask God to help us to be truly good men. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighted in his way. Help us, Lord, to allow you to order our steps. I think that is maybe the, the takeaway, the biggest takeaway from this passage is we have to let you order our steps and help us, Lord, to um, allow you to do that, to submit to the Holy Spirit, even if it's a little bit uncomfortable, or show us ourselves, uh, show us others, give us proper priorities and perspectives uh, in our relationships. We thank you, Lord, for the relationships that we have. We know that work will always be there. And, and you made us to work. We know it's not a result of the curse. It was pre-curse. And, uh, Lord, we feel fulfilled in that. Uh, there's something about completing a project that makes us feel good. But help us remember that people are always more important than projects. The projects are always there. And that give us a good balance, Lord. Help us to be the provider, but also be present. We ask, Lord, that uh, our wives would feel loved, that we would be sensitive, we would be kind. I pray our, our kids, uh, Lord, would feel that uh, they're cared for. And I just ask God that we would balance the, the seasons of life and be aware of uh, which season we're in, what, what we need to be doing. And help us to learn from this example, Lord. We don't want to see this happen in our lives or any home uh, in our church, or we don't want to see this take place. So give us wisdom. Help us to learn from the warning. And Lord, we just love you. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the men that were here and those that joined us and those that may be watching this at some later point. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Be strong today. See you guys. Take care. Good day, Nick.